There's always an there's always a cynic in our midst. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, announcements. Okay, very good. Thank you, Carl. October 21st, which is our congregational meeting, we're going to have a speaking day. That's right, right? Got that October 21st is not a congregational meeting. Okay. We're receiving new members. No, 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 no. Yes. I knew it was something. <laughs> so, I'm including myself. Uh, we're going to have a spaghetti dinner. Okay. On the 21st. Okay. Very good. And the 14th is a session meeting, so be in prayer for that. Um, and then November 4th is the congregational meeting. There's going to be elections, and then there'll be a, uh, an, an examination of where we are financially. And that's because we're going to be handing out some pledge cards, and the session feels the responsibility of creating a budget in keeping with a prayerful uh, pledge uh, for the year of 2019 that's coming. And to not do so uh, is somewhat irresponsible. So this is the path we're choosing, and you will get that shortly. Uh, and... Take it home, pray, discuss, and help us to create a budget that is faithful and responsible. Yes. And in all of those dates, October 28th, the Cobra Baby, we're planning on, or pastors, pastors baptism, and the, the Cobra Baby, and the deacons plan on having a reception after that baptism. Just a cake and coffee, that kind of thing. But anyway, so October's ending up being as busy as September. Yeah, good thing. Yes. Yes, there's uh, a baptism on the 28th, the Sunday closest to the Reformation. Uh, it will be Reformation Sunday, I think, as well. So that's glorious. And uh, uh, there'll be a baptism there with uh, at least one. So, okay. Um, I'll remind you earlier, but November 4th is Daylight Savings Sunday, so as important as that is, you should probably be aware of that as well. Okay, any other announcements or anything? Okay. Um, Uh, yes? <laughs> no, I'm ju just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, let's stand, but we're changing the song to the Red Book, number 212. Uh, Majesty. And that's in keeping with the psalm that we're going to be responsively reading and also singing. So I just thought we would just get it from three sides, our opening as well as our responsive reading and responsive psalm singing. This is uh, based on, could be Psalm 8, also Isaiah 24, um, Majesty. Uh, who knows this music at all? Uh, good. Bonnie, would you come up here and, I'm just, okay. Uh, I kind of know it. I hope we do okay with it. Carol is out with a migraine, and Becky is uh, out of town. So uh, I think I know this one. So um, let's uh, open up with a word of prayer first of all, and then we will sing our song. Our most heavenly, gracious Father, we are invigorated with the moisture that you've sent and the temperatures are a reminder that we live in a life of constant, continuous change. One philosopher said 
that you can't put your foot in the same river twice or in the same place in the same river twice because it's flowing and time is like that and your word tells us that we're but a vapor and we arise and quickly disappear like steam from a kettle truly the seasons remind us that trees blossom and flowers bloom and they fade year after year and we are blooming and we will also shed this mortal body this tabernacle and transition into eternity. So Lord, in this rhythm of worship, help us to be mindful of our creaturely status and yet of your promise of immortality. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing number 212 in the red book. Uh, majesty, worship his majesty. And may God help us sing. Um, okay, that might help us. Don't, don't, don't panic. Uh, okay, <laughs> uh, Majesty, worship His Majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority flows from his throne unto his own, his anthems raise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship his majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Please be seated. Part of his majesty is his sinlessness. And part of his majesty is that he has bestowed undeserved favor, demerited favor upon those who are sin-filled, and that's us. And so we come before his majesty with confession of sin, taken from Psalm 119. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless. Blessed are those who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies. Blessed are those who seek him with their whole heart. Blessed are those who do no wrong. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame. Having my eyes fixed on all your commandments, I will pray with an upright heart. The same one who bore our judgment has imparted his spirit within us. In this mystical union that we now possess by faith, we are empowered to bear fruit that is pleasing to him. The prayer of our heart, therefore, is, Will what pleases you, O Lord, and grant what you will. In Christ, we have confessed, we are not what we should be. We are sinners. His law justly weighs in, making our conscience feel its transgressions. But we are not under law. We are under grace. In the midst of his judgments, Christ has borne the fury of a just and holy wrath on our behalf. Therefore, our guilt is gone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. All sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field. The birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And now we'll sing the psalm insert. Uh, you might have another insert because I forgot to put the hymn in the thing. So what you're looking for is Psalm 8. And uh, that is, uh, should be close by you somewhere or in your bulletin. And I'm not only short of stature, but I'm short of memory. And so I ask your indulgence here for a moment as I uh, come prepared my second Boy Scout um, pledge to be prepared. Hopefully it works here. Uh, my God, my God. No, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's not it. Ah, Lord, there you are. Okay. Looking at the Ron Psalm, looking at next week's here. Um, Lord, our Lord in all the earth, where did you go? Hmm. Well, I did pass second class, but apparently... Uh, uh, that did not work this morning. This is a familiar tune of sorts. Um, Lord, our Lord and all the earth. Is your name. Um, Amsterdam. Hmm. Well, anybody know the tune? Going once, going twice. And you, you above the heavens set the glory of your fame. From the mouths of infant Jan, you the power of praise and compose. Dee, 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 dee. From the mouths of infants, Jan, you the power of praise come. Okay, I give up. Ah, I'll read it. A lot of reading today. Lord, our Lord in all the earth, how excellent your name. You above the heavens have set the glory of your fame. From the mouths of infants young, you the power of praise compose. In the face of enemies to stop avenging foes. When I view the skies above, the works of your fingers made, when I see the moon and stars which you in order laid, what is man so frail and weak 
that you should remember him. What can be the son of man that you should care for him? You have made him next to God with honor, glory crowned. Him you placed above your works, beneath him all is found. Oxen, sheep, and beasts that graze, birds and fish the oceans claim. Lord, our Lord in all the earth, how excellent your name. Well, that was my best attempt. So, we will now have the reading of God's word. The first reading today is from Genesis 2, 18 to 24. Hear the word of the Lord. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to man to see what he would call him. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and every beast in the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made it into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she is taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. The word of the Lord. The New Testament reading is from Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, and 2, 5 through 12. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making pur purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking, it has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. The word of the Lord.
The Gospel reading comes to us from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 2 through 16. The Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Let not man, what, God, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again of this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he, looked, and he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hand on them. The word of the Lord. Now let's stand and sing together number 206, or it's on your bench, your pew, Heaven at Home. And could I possibly fail twice in being a Boy Scout? Uh, the answer to that is no. So we do have this. I'm going to play it right now just so you can look at the music. Uh, maybe you can hear it. <laughs> Where mothers pour his mercy on daughters of his love. Bum, bum. Okay, let's stand and sing together. Um, number 207. I think it says 206, but that's correct. Uh, so. How fragrant like sweet heaven, that home where Christ is Lord, where fathers love his gospel, and sons feed on his word. Where mothers pour his mercy on daughters of his love, where waves of his compassion bring joy where'er they move. How beautiful their union, how godlike I can ring, how like that triune oneness who reigns in heaven unseen. Who like that God incarnate of God and man the Son? How marvelous affection the many live as one. 
One flesh, one heart, one spirit, one bone, one blood, one soul, one covenantal promise to keep while ages roll. One blended life that gives life to children clothed with prayer. One mighty rock, one shelter from every storm and care. Come, feast of heaven's ta table. Come, taste of rich delight. Come, revel and come, ravish with pleasures passing sight. Come, radiant, holy splendor, knit all our hearts in one. Come, mirror, hear your glories, great Father, Spirit, Son. Please be seated. Lord, help us to preach and help us to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay. Well, I feel more weak than ever with these texts, but we will do what we can, and may God have mercy. But let's take a look, first of all, at Mark chapter 10, briefly. Because in some sense, these texts can be woven together quite nicely. And it all has to do with God's majesty, who he is. You know, it's the Marxists of the 20th century who had a confidence that actually was quite impressive. Because Marx taught an economic determinism. Capitalism wasn't just something wrong. Capitalism was a necessary process that would yield his utopia. And so Marx wasn't not just critical of capitalism. He had every confidence in the world that as it flourished, it itself would implode. And he had reasons for that. And not a few articles addressed this confidence of Marxists that history would finally vindicate them. And by way of analogy, now just hear me out, by way of analogy, Christians are in the same boat as a Marxist. Because a Marxist did not see his or her utopia, but they were ever so confident that it would come to pass. And we sang together, and we have uh, read together that uh, in our text that... Um, we don't need to turn there, we'll be there soon enough, but in the Hebrews passage... Verse 9, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. You see, Christians have a wait and see calling. It isn't dominion through and through, nor will it be dominion through and through. These verses teach a temperate 
expectation. Or rather, it molds the expectation for the future culmination of Jesus' return. And thus the verbiage of Hebrews regarding Jesus himself, but we see him who for a little while must be lower than the angels. How is Jesus made a little lower than the angels? Have you ever wondered? He's made a little lower than the angels because of him taking on human flesh and by laying aside the right to reign and rule. He laid it aside to this degree that he's going to be apprehended, persecuted, and indeed tortured and put to death. That's how he has laid aside his glory. Remember when he was before the high priest, I think Caiaphas, and or was it Pilate? I think it was Pilate. And Pilate says, man, speak up for yourself. Do you not know that I have the power to put you to death? And that's what they're requesting. Say something. He thought he was a religious fanatic, but he didn't want to put together human life needlessly. He wanted Jesus to speak up. And remember Jesus' response. You are only doing what God has allowed you to do. And by the word of my mouth, I could call legions of angels and literally wipe out the planet. Amen. That's right. So, we are in, as believers, a little window of similar laying aside. But we should have every confidence that a Marxist has and beyond because our story, our utopia, is rooted and grounded in history of a person who has become man and he's promised the ending and he has said it is over. Whereas Marx is nothing more than a Christian heresy and he has nothing to point to other than his own mind telling uh, us that somehow the economics of the world will yield his utopia. Totally fanciful. Totally out to lunch. But Jesus' claim and we as his followers know for sure because of that event that has solidified and has guaranteed the ending of history. It's coming. But we must learn, as our Lord himself has learned, to, for a little while, be made lower than the angels. Okay, now, to Mark's gospel. How does this all get related? Well, the Pharisees, of course, are trying to test Jesus. And they ask him if it's allowable to divorce your wife. There were two major strands, like Republicans and Democrats, within the Jewish community at this time. One said that divorce, being a strongly patriarchal culture, if your wife burnt the toast, you could divorce her. No problem. As a matter of fact, They were so liberal with male privilege that they said, if you have looked upon another and you think you need to trade her in, you're quite free to do that. Now, you might be scowned by by the community, but you're free. Now, the other movement within Judaism at this time was a strict rendering of the freedom to divorce. And indeed, they said that you could not divorce except for some extreme situations. And so Jesus is being tested. It's like the election for the presidency, and it's the Republican or Democratic presidential primary debates. And they ask Jesus this loaded question. And he turns the tables on them. 
that old fox. He says, well, what did Moses command you? And they correctly cite Moses. Well, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. We got him. He's going to either go this way or this way. When he goes this way, he's going to split his base. That's political jargon. And they knew it. But Jesus says this. Well, it's true. But, Jesus, but Moses allowed it because of the hardness of your hearts. Dane, he always gets out of the pickle that we put him in. He didn't answer A or B. He answered we. He answered that we, humanity, has a heart problem. And the reason for the certificate of divorce was precisely we have a problem. It's called sin. And so God, in compassionate mercy, allowed for this action to take place place now he goes further in verse 6 but from the beginning Jesus answer is so beautiful it's so marvelous Jesus goes back even before Moses to the very beginning which we have in our first reading that Bill read in the beginning Jesus said and there's a contrastive there Verse 6, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Now, if people try to tell you, this is a little paraphrase, and uh, I won't get lost on it, but it needs to be said. Regarding Christian sexual ethics, which are coming under attack by the world, yes, that's astounding enough given Romans chapter 1, but they're coming under attack from the church itself. And the first thing I hear, the most voluminous thing that I hear from those who want this paradigm to be turned upside down or inside out, they said, Jesus didn't say anything about homosexuality. And then by implication, what they mean by that is it's not that important. It's not that germane. It's not that basic. It's not that crucial. But I beg to differ with both premises. It's true that Jesus did not say anything explicitly mentioning homosexuality, though there's a little bit on the eunuch thing that he may have, but we're not going there. But certainly in this text, he confirms and affirms the complementary nature of creation and marriage itself. Verse 6, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. That's creation. Then he goes on to marriage. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Now that addresses homosexuality by implication because Jesus is going back to a pre-fallen, no sin present in the world, in creation, and he demonstrates that this complementarity is by God's design. It is so impregnated in life itself that Paul will use the word natural and unnatural to talk about those who want to invert sexual ethics and make men love men and women love women. Not so. Jesus says from the beginning, before sin came in to being in our world and in the human heart, God made them male and female, and a son was to leave his parents and cleave to his wife. Now, so I think he does speak about homosexuality in very clear principled terms and the Westminster Confession which we hold is the best representation of Scripture says that we can teach not only what Scripture explicitly teaches but by way of implication by way of logical implication and the logical implication here brothers and sisters is before sin entered the world complementarity was at the root of God's created order 
And furthermore, since it was at the root of created order, Christians can love humanity, love the common neighbors that God has placed us with, with unbelievers, and he can allow us and he wants us to fight in a democracy for that created order. Order. Why? Well, because Paul's clear that God's judgment is revealed now in present tense against those who so invert the basic created order that God will not stand by for long. He will not forbear indefinitely and he will rain down his judgment. And I'm scared for the world. I'm scared for Western civilization in particular. Because there's been no society that has institutionalized the inversion of this complementarity that God gave at creation. Now, sociologists might try to find a tribe of 20 in New Guinea, and I'm not being facetious here, but <laughs> for all practical points and intents, it has never been institutionalized. Where homosexuality was prevalent and affirmed in Greek culture at the time that Paul and Jesus existed, homosexuality was approved. It was mostly pederastry, which is males taking young adolescent boys and having their sexual exploits. That was okay. It was looked the other way. It's expected. But they didn't even institutionalize marriage of same-sex couples. I fear God's judgment, brothers and sisters. Okay, now... Jump down to verse 13 in Matthew 10, or Mark 10. We touched on this last week or the week before. And we were, when they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. Jesus saw it and was indignant. We talked about how children are prized in our culture. We send cards out. We get cards in response. We have showers. All of this stuff is good and beautiful. But in this day and age, the male did not spend a whole lot of time with any child, particularly the male child, until that male child could read and write and dialogue with him about the Torah. Children were not given a pedestal existence as they are in our culture. That's first. But secondly, it's beyond just that they weren't fully given a role of importance until they could read the Torah. There's more than that. Not only is that true, but, brothers and sisters, they were known as the people, as the ones in whom were persecuted and were taken advantage of. They were the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. And what do I mean by that? Well, just stay in your seat. In Lamentations, which comes after Jeremiah, you know, you don't need to turn there. I'm going to read you a few verses to drive home this point about why Jesus uses children as an example in many places. Lamentations 1, chapter 1, verse 5. Her foes have become the head. Her enemies prosper because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Now hear this. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. You see, children are vulnerable. They're vulnerable in a world that is filled with trouble, that isn't stable. And your children are the most vulnerable and they get abused. That's what the environment is in here. Likewise, in Lamentations chapter 2, verse 11, uh, my eyes are spent with weeping, my stomach churns. Why? Well, because of the destruction, because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. You see, the metaphor or the, the, the symbolism of children isn't the beautiful pedestal pink and blue 
Gucci Gucci image that scripture uses here. It uses children as the total opposite. They get abused and persecuted, and when it comes to conflict between nations, those children suffer. And so, what do we look at here? What is Jesus' point here? Verse 13, when they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, his disciples rebuked them. Yes, he's saying, your values are skewed. Okay, you're a little too patriarchal for my liking, perhaps. I can't be sure of that, but I think that's implicit. Children are not to be seen, but not heard from until the Torah state. That's not true. That's, that's too much here. But the main point is, he rebuked them because Jesus, God, is seeking his elect precisely from that group. You mean infants? No. Broken, abused, bruised people. That's the point here. Okay? That's the point of using children in the text. Is not their loveliness, but it's their vulnerability. Okay. Now, Jesus went back to creation. And we see that here in the text that Bill read to us in Genesis, chapter 2, verse 18. And Jesus quotes it. And indeed, Hebrews quotes it. And so, what, is all, what are all of these texts going to? What is the unifying theme here? And I would argue that the unifying theme, and the reason why marriage is being the focus of these liturgical readings is actually found in Psalm 8. That's in our call to praise on page 2. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Majestic. How great and mighty are you in importance, in Separation from all that is as creator. You, O Lord, reign supreme. This is the reason why marriage can be funneled up to the climax of who God is. That's why the creation story is so important. That's why the marriage before sin enters the world is so important. Because marriage, now get this, you could write down quickly Ephesians chapter 5, marriage was established in all its facets to point us to the covenant that God has with his people. The covenant that God has with his people is not an afterthought. It's, if anything, marriage is the afterthought of God's desire to bring a people to himself in faithful commitment. And so therefore, marriage is a shining beacon to the world of God's love to humanity. It's permanent, it's exclusive, it's ecstatic, it's beautiful, it's pleasurable, it's all of those things. That's why marriage is. It reflects God's covenantal marriage with his people. If you're flip-flopping in the Hebrews passage, chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. So, Jesus in his God-manness, in answering the Pharisees and the disciples in Mark chapter 10 about marriage, says in the beginning, God created them male and female. That's the Son. That's the Word who is created. And that complementarity has his stamp of approval in it, through it, and all around it. 
That's why we should be so gleeful, so hopeful about marriage. Yes, hard times are coming. Yes, in this life there's struggles. Yes, in this life there's failings. And yes, though Jesus was not focusing on this, there are even biblical justifications to end a marriage that is ended by someone's behavior. In particular, Protestants have always said adultery can destroy the covenant. They've also said that desertion can destroy the covenant. You're not bound to go chasing someone in Antarctica because of someone's meanderings and unaccountable presence. Now, what other contextual situations could there be if you beat somebody? Are you violating the covenant? All of these things are very difficult. And that's why Jesus goes back to God's original intent. Male, female, permanent, exclusive, bound in covenant to one another. And yes, beautiful, enjoyable, pleasurable, and delightful. All of that, brothers and sisters, is God's heartbeat of redemption for his people. It is an amazing thing. One theologian, Thomas Schreiner, whom we are following in Galatians, which, by the way, I think starts soon. Um, uh, whoops. Started last Wednesday. Whoops. Okay. Thomas Schreiner has said this. Hebrews chapter 1, which which Carol read to us, verses 1 through 4 can be summarized this way. God has spoken finally and definitively in his Son. Now let me repeat that for emphasis. God has spoken finally and definitively in his Son. Ah, oh. oh, keep that in mind. Now, go back to the call of praise in your bulletin, page 2. Mm. The second C. <laughs> well, let's go to the second L. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, when I do this, and I'm sure here in Torrington many of you do this frequently, he comes up with a question. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Two things to note here. Mindfulness and caring. One is an awareness. And he's arguing this argument is a popular argument. You go from the greater to the lesser and make a point. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars that you've set in place, and brothers and sisters, we have the equipment this day to blow our minds away. The vastness of the universe just makes physicists shudder. Oh yes, they spew forth their theories, and you say, boy, they surely know what they're talking about. But they get changed frequently, because the data is overwhelming. The largeness of the universe just blows the minds of even the most educated away. So when I look at the heavens and their vastness, and in Romans 1 says he's clearly showed himself, his power and his attributes through and by the things that he's made. So the psalmist is saying this, given that the fact that the heavens are there, given the fact that the heavens speak a language to the human heart, that God is great, powerful, and mighty, why are you even concerned about us? You see the argument from the greater to the lesser? That's supposed to be this conundrum. It's supposed to be, an which will eventually lead to an astonishment. Why are, you evil, why are you even mindful about us? And the Son of Man that you care for him. So we're talking now not only an awareness, Okay, we're not just talking about mindfulness, we're talking about why do you even take the time? And you see that in Mark, don't you? The children came to Jesus, 
And the disciples rebuked him because why? Jesus was taking the time. Now the disciples were mindful of children, but they wanted no time spent with them. What is Jesus doing here? Wow, he's citing Matthew, uh, Psalm 8. God is mindful of us, just like you disciples are mindful of children. But God, in his majesty and mightness, he is caring for us. Unlike you who think children should be seen and heard. And so Jesus was indignant because their behavior transgressed the nature of the God whom they said they were serving. If God is mindful of us and cares for us, let these children be. And he picked them up and set them on his lap. They must have just stood there in astonished wonder. Why the dis... What? All right, Jesus, you know. We'll wait this thing out. And yet that was the message that Jesus was trying to teach them. The care, the concern. Now, is there something more here pointing us forward to the majesty of Jesus himself? Well, yes. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? The son of man? Well, in Hebrews, the chapter 1, the text in the bulletin, it has been testified somewhere, what is man? that you are mindful of him, or the son of man, that you care for him. For you made him a little, for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. So far, so good. That's just human beings. So the context of the psalm would seem to delimit it to that. Verse 8. Then something astonished happens. Astonishing happens in verse 8 in Hebrews chapter 2 putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. I don't think he can be talking about just humanity here. Now it's true, God put the created order under Adam as a vice regent. He had him name the animals. He had him till the garden. He had him be his vice regent in his place. But do you see the heightened language here in Hebrews chapter 2 verse uh, 9. Now we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. So now the psalmist or now the writer of Hebrews looks back at Psalms and sees that it's proper fulfillment, it's consummation, is not just man himself, it's Jesus Christ. So in the context of Psalm, if you were not aware of Jesus Christ, you would limit this to God's great crowning glory, man and woman created in his image and told to go reign and rule as his vice regent. But the writer of Hebrews sees that Christ is from the beginning and that this, this son of man really is pointing to Jesus Christ and a end arrival of the kingdom of heaven. Now remember in my opening remarks regarding Marx. Marx is sure. Marx is convinced. Marx is absolutely, totally persuaded that his utopia is coming. Likewise here, the Christian is totally persuaded that creation is being brought along to a consummation. And that consummation is found in Jesus. And because of faith, we are in him marching to glory. Guaranteed, secured, unable to be stopped. It will reach its consummatory point, its apex. And it is further than the garden itself. And how do I know that? Because when Jesus comes back, 
A Jerusalem drops out of heaven in cubical symbolic language. Everything's overlaid with gold and we don't need the sun anymore or the moon or the stars because Jesus himself is our sun. Now that's language that's obviously symbolic. But what does it mean? It means that the creation in Genesis even before the fall had a consummation point that God was even going to take a non-sinful created order. But then sin came and redemption came and God will not be denied. Creation will reach its culminating point of no return because it was God's good pleasure and he is majestic. He is the sovereign one and all that he accomplishes is according to his good pleasure pleasure he will not be denied in the name of the father son and holy spirit amen let us then confess this triunity of God in the Apostles Creed by saying that we believe in the Father we believe in the Son and we believe in the Holy Spirit at the beginning and let us stand please uh, I believe in Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in the only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And let us with thanksgiving sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary, evermore praising you and singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Yet for a little while, Jesus laid something aside. We're still in the period of laying something aside. He isn't ruling and reigning in the fullest actualized sense of the term. Indeed, it seems like he's not reigning and ruling at all. Much of the time, according to the eyes that have no faith. 
And so he instilled in his covenant people a rhythm of embracing, reaffirming, and having faith in his covenantal promises. And it's in this meal here. And when he gathered with his disciples before his crucifixion, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. In the same way, he took the cup of blessing, and when he had given thanks, he poured the fruit of the vine. And he said, this is the covenant of the New Testament. My blood shed for you for the remission of sins. This drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. And with those limited instructions and that invitation, he gives to his people his covenantal nearness. May I have an elder, please, in the assistance of the distribution, please. <clears throat> For a little while, we're still in that little while time. So please come, receive his nearness, and be fed. Christ's body. Christ's body. Carol, the blood of Christ shed for you. Bill, the blood, blood of Christ body. shed for you. Darlene, the blood of Christ shed for you. Thank you. Beth, the blood of Christ shed for you. Christ's blood. Carolyn, the blood of Christ shed for you. Gary, the blood of Christ shed for you. Christ's blood. Bonnie, the blood of Christ shed for you. Glenn, the blood of Christ shed for you. Grace, the blood of Christ shed for you. Pearl, the blood of Christ shed for you. Kay, the blood of Christ shed for you. Wade, the blood of Christ shed for you. Susan, the blood of Christ shed for you. Luke, the blood of Christ shed for you. Christ's body. Hope, the blood of Christ shed for you. Christ's body. Katie, the blood of Christ shed for you. Christ's body. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Christ's the blood body. of Christ shed for you. Christ's body. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ, Christ's Carolyn, body. shed for you. Kirby, may the Spirit rest upon you and be mighty. May you know his favor throughout your days. In Christ's name, amen. Lee, the blood of Christ, Christ shed for you. Christ's blood. Pat, the blood of Christ shed for you. Adele, the blood of Christ shed for you. Lee, the blood of Christ shed for you. Through the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. And Charlie, may the Spirit Christ of blood. God be upon you all your days. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Carl, blood. the blood of Christ shed for you. Roy, the blood of Christ shed for you. Christ's body given for you. And the blood of Christ, Kurt, shed for you.
Let's stand and sing our last hymn together, number 66, Sent Forth. As God draws near in his closeness, he then sends us forth because we're still in that little while where God is gathering his people to himself. So we must be sent. We must leave. We must go. Number 66. Sent forth by God's blessing, our true faith confessing, the people of God from his dwelling take leave. He is ended, oh, now be extended, the fruits of this service in all who believe. Teaching, receptive souls reaching shall blossom in action for God and for all. Grace did invite us, his love shall unite us for God's kingdom and answer his call. With praise and thanksgiving to God ever living, the tasks of our everyday life we will face. Our faith ever sharing, in love ever caring, embracing his children of each tribe and race. With your feast you feed us, with your light now lead us, unite us as one in this life that we share. All the living, The benediction comes to you from Deuteronomy chapter 4. For what great nation is there that has a God so near as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? Go in that nearness. Go in the peace of Jesus Christ who brings God near. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. And there are goodies.